abstinence-based uh, program, which means that um, anyone participating needs to be abstinent from all alcohol and other illicit substances. Um, and we're also very much a 12-step-based program, so we follow the, the tenets of the 12 steps um, and really focus on approaches like CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, um, motivational interviewing, um, some DBT approaches as well, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, um, and psychodynamic approaches, which is just really building connections with our clients and um, building rapport. Denial is a key factor that keeps people from recovering is that the patient denies the existence of a problem. And denial takes many forms, either rationalization, uh, justification, minimizing that the drugs and alcohol are causing negative effects in their life. So there's a lot of different forms of denial that have to be addressed both with the patient and with the family. Um, well, I think there are a lot of benefits of group therapy. First of all, when you're in a group, um, a group kind of mimics, uh, how you behave in a group kind of mimics how you are in the, in the real world. So when you actually um, have a consistent group together, you, you can actually start to see patterns of behavior um, that you can identify within yourself and with others and that can be reflected to you. Um, so, for example, um, if you have a tendency to uh, not um, express how you're feeling, somebody may notice that and give you feedback around that. So it helps you become more aware of your own behavior. And um, also, the, the group concept helps people, particularly in recovery, really relate to each other and support each other um, because what you know, there's there's a lot of shame in um, substance abuse and um, a lot of feelings of guilt that are hard to talk about sometimes. And when you're in a group with other people who can really relate to what you're going through and what you've done and what you've gone through, um, it really helps alleviate some of the pain that people are in when they're going through this process because particularly in early recovery, um, there are a lot of emotions that people are feeling and there's a lot of stuff going on beyond just the, the substance use. So when, once you get rid of the substances and all the feelings come out, being in a group with other people going through the same thing can really help you work through those issues. Well, one of the biggest ones is being able to express one's feelings. Uh, a lot of alcoholics and uh, addicts were coping by using drugs and numbing their feelings so being able to express oneself and how they feel no matter happy uh, being angry or upset and getting the, the support they need to uh, know that they do not have to resort uh, to substances to get past feelings that previously have been overwhelming and difficult uh, to overcome without drug use? There are a variety of ways. I think one of the primary um, things that we focus on is really helping people identify what their triggers are. Um, and that's different for everybody. And by triggers, I mean things that might lead to a relapse. So, you know, somebody, for example, a trigger could be being around particular family members or. Um, being in a bar or a restaurant, or if they're watching a movie, seeing, you know, drug paraphernalia, things like that. Um, also certain behaviors, um, people start noticing that they're, re they're relapsing in behaviors that are reminiscent of what they did when using, so like, for example, isolating, um, maybe not telling the truth all the time, not being honest. Um, you know, not uh, not associating with other sober people. Uh, if people can start to recognize what what are the triggers in themselves, they can start to notice signs in themselves when which might lead to a relapse. 
um, because what we know about when someone relapses is the relapse starts way before someone actually picks up a substance or a drink. The relapse starts with the, the, the trigger, starts with the behavioral patterns, and the, the, the actual picking up of the substance or a drink is really the final part of the relapse. It's not the start. Um, AA has been really important to me in a lot of different ways. I, um, you know, prior to joining AA, I had gone to treatment a couple times, which was helpful. I went to inpatient, and that helped me, obviously, to stop drinking because it was a controlled environment. But AA has really given me a support network and a framework to live my everyday life in the world, and um, it's given me a community and uh, just an outside support network. And especially working the 12 steps has been really important to me. AA provides a social network, it provides friends and sobriety, and it provides me with a connection to people who not only share my struggle, but also um, can relate to me and just sort of share our sober journey together. Well, I think substance abuse addiction um, is a, can be looked at as a chronic disease. And, um, you know, it's something that doesn't just ever go away and needs constant work and attention. And what that looks like for people is different for everybody. Um, for some people, it's attending support group meetings on a regular basis. Um, and really working 12 steps for other people. They have other means of staying sober that are helpful to them, like therapy. Um, but uh, relapse we consider sort of part of the disease. Um, and, you know, it, what we do know is that when somebody gets sober, you know, for the first time, especially the first year of um, sobriety, there's a 83% chance of relapse which shows that it's, it's a lot more common than not and a lot more expected than not. And it's, you know, it's sort of like if you look at, an, uh, if you're looking at it as a chronic disease, like something like diabetes, diabetes is very treatable. You know, as long as you're taking your medicine, as long as you're living a healthy lifestyle and eating the right foods, you can keep your diabetes under control. Um, if you stop doing what you need to do to t take control of your diabetes, uh, then you'll start to get sick again. And it's the same thing with addiction. Um, it's a constant, uh, you know, there has to be sort of a constant process of um, what are you doing to protect your sobriety, uh, just like anything else, because when you start, when you stop, you know, quote unquote, taking your medicine, whatever that is for you, um, that's when you're more likely to start using again. The 12 steps has been really important. AA is obviously a 12-step program, and in order to stay sober for the long term, it's really important to work all 12 steps. Um, you know, the first step was most important for me and for a lot of people, just in admitting that I was powerless over alcohol, because without that admission, I would find that I would continue to try to drink, because there was sort of a question in my mind whether or not I could control my drinking until I really surrendered to the fact that I can't. Um, I wasn't able to stop. So the 12 steps has given me really a nice framework to stop drinking and then in the absence of alcohol it's given me tools to live life in a sober way and to sort of decrease a lot of the risks that would increase the likelihood that I drink again, such as, um, you know, it. It gives me a connection to a higher power, which for many of us that's just the rooms of AA and admitting that we can't stop drinking alone and that we need each other. For other people it's God. For me it has been both. Um, which knowing that there's something greater than me out there to help me and feeling that, you know, through all of my difficult struggles, I do feel like today I have a purpose. Like I was still kept on this earth for a reason and that certainly a higher power is there with me. So. AA provides a lot of comfort in that sense. Um, the fourth step is really important part of AA, just in terms of looking at myself and my patterns and a lot of the things that actually 
increase the likelihood that I would drink and through sharing that with another person in the fifth step it sort of removes the weight from your life that you've been carrying throughout prior to stopping drinking. Um, in the sixth and seventh step I was able to sort of through self-examination in the fourth step highlight the character defects that also increase my likelihood to drink and then the eighth and ninth step I was able to make amends and look at my part in things and resentments were a big part of why I drank and you know through uh, trying to make things right with the people who had harmed me and that I had also done harm to I'm able to live a life that's a lot more free and then in the ninth and tenth and uh, the tenth and eleventh step it's through you know just daily inventory and self-examination uh, eleven through prayer meditation I have connection to a higher power and then the 12th step is just really giving it all back. So everything that this program has given me, I pass on to someone else. So it's been wonderful in that regard. Family therapy is a really important part of the process in recovery um, because, you know, often there's this idea that parents have, um, and, I'm, and I'm looking at it as, as if, you, if you have a kid who has, um, an addiction. Parents have this idea that you can just sort of drop your kids off and they'll, you know, to a substance abuse treatment center or a residential facility and they'll just get fixed. But the thing about family, that we know about family systems are, you know, people are influenced by, you know, other people and, and families create p patterns of communication and of behaviors that don't just go away. So, if you have, you know, say you're you're getting sober and you're changing your behavior, um, and you're changing how you are with with those around you, if nobody else is changing, for example, in your family, then the tendency is for the family system to revert back to what it was. Um, there's this sort of natural inclination for homeostasis and wanting to keep the family, um, you know, as it is because whatever. Uh, patterns of behavior that might be adaptive or might be maladaptive, when when somebody um, changes, it upsets the apple cart, even if they're changing for the better. So um, it's really important that other members of the family are also involved in looking at their own behaviors and how um, they can change in in order to for the whole the whole, the whole family to change. Um. Well, I mean, we, we usually approach substance abuse as it's never just about substance abuse. Um, there's always underlying issues. There are reasons that people use. Um, and, I mean, some of the more common, dual, you know, if you want to call them dual diagnoses, are um, things like generalized anxiety disorder, um, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, borderline personality, um, major depressive disorder, um, and also a lot of, um, you know, learning, you know, learning issues like ADD and ADHD. Um, because really what substance abuse is about is, is you know, self-medicating those other issues. Um, so it's a, the way the Center for Living approaches it is the reason that we have, we require um, all of our clients to be abstinent is that you can't really work on the other issues unless you're sober. Um, you, you, the idea is to work on sobriety along with the other issues in tandem, but you can't really get to what's going on with someone, for example, who has um, you know, bipolar diso disorder if they're using, um, because we don't even know what their um, baseline is for what that means. So, um, in order to be in touch with your emotions and what's going on and having a clear mind around them, you have to have the, the sobriety piece.